I've listened to Let Go by Avril Lavigne for months. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the record ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me, losing his grip, is Connor. Listen, it's complicated. It's complicated. Have you ever been a skater boy? Only when I'm with you. Oh, okay. I wasn't going into the whole name and tracks <laughs> thing. You never <laughs> skated around me. Don't lie. I never even like played much of like the Tony Hawk skater games. I did a little bit. That's as close to skater boy as I got. Mm. But yeah, we're talking about Avril Lavigne this week. How do you feel about pop punk? I never really listened to much Avril Lavigne. Really? But I feel like I know all of her big songs because she's such a memed or like referenced artist i feel like referenced maybe memed i don't know about made into a meme but... i guess not like memed but like I, I don't know tiktok i don't know her stuff is used in funny videos mm. like the why'd you have to go and make it so complicated or there's others i thought of when i was listening to this album we'll get to it later in my notes where it's like this is something that like i've seen referenced or like used as jokes i've seen it actually in a lot of text-based memes where somebody will like use her, a line from her song as a comment to to another post mm, that's a weird way to encounter music because if you're not familiar with the song like what does that mean yeah. to you just a snippet of lyric i mean that's how that's how all references are right if you're not aware of what the reference is it's meaningless to you it's kind of how it works i mean believe me i know <laughs> have we talked about how few movies i've seen that's a topic for another podcast <laughs> So, you know, a little bit, you know, the complicateds and the skater boys and the... I'm glad we didn't continue with the naming thing we sometimes do. I don't know what we would have done when we got to the last track. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I knew when to stop. Uh, we're, we're nobody's fools, that's for sure. We're our own fools, really. Yeah. I didn't necessarily know a ton of Avril Lavigne stuff either. I was kind of in the same boat as you. Complicated, though, it's like a core memory of music for me. It's like 2002 on the school bus, like, complicated on pop radio. Yes, I remember that. The rest of it kind of eluded me a little bit. Hmm. I mean, I know we have friends that like Avril Lavigne a lot. Hi, if you're listening to this episode, you know who you are. And if you're not, how dare you? But we'll message you that later. We'll, we'll have a talk about that if you're not listening to this episode. I'll, mes I'll message them right now and just say, how dare you? And they'll be like, what? How dare you? <laughs> and, then in, and then in several weeks when this comes out, they'll get it. But yeah, no, I was excited to dig into this album. I love a little pop punk, a little throwback. At this point, wow, two decades old. That's a thought. Wow. I know. Let's talk about Avril Lavigne, who admittedly I also did not know much about until starting to research for this episode. So I learned a lot this week too. Avril Ramona Lavigne was born in Ontario, Canada on September 27th, 1984. Wow. Yeah, this is the week of her birthday, as a matter of fact, when this episode comes out. Oh, I guess it is. I didn't plan that, I swear, but we've done it again. <laughs> Starting to think you're doing it on purpose. It seems that way. You're, you're crying wolf a lot. Well, but sometimes I do it on purpose. Like when we did Earth, Wind, and Fire <laughs> earlier in the month, that was definitely planned. Yeah. Like this was not. This was a coincidence. Sometimes we've done stuff on album release announcements. Sometimes we've done it on album release anniversaries. I swear most of it is just coincidental. But yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, closer to her first birthday than this one, uh, her parents <laughs> knew that she was going to be a singer from a very young age. Apparently, she would sing along to songs on the way home from church when she was like two years old, which is wild. I don't know how much singing I did it to, but it was not enough to clue anybody in that that would be a career path. <laughs> but they noticed that. And so her parents, as she grew up, they helped her develop that fair bit of natural musical talent that she had. Her parents bought her keyboards and drums and guitars, and her dad even converted their basement into a studio so that they could record their own music, which is really neat. Wow. That's dedication. And funny enough, you know, for the pop punk direction that her own music would evolve into by the time she started releasing songs, she got her start in country music. She would play at fairs and festivals and sing Garth Brooks, Shania Twain. By the time she was a teenager, she was writing her own cheesy little love songs. In 1999, though, her career got a major... 
like super jump start. Little 15 year old Avril Lavigne wins a contest. I didn't maybe even go as far as say like mega jump start. Yes. I don't even know if it counts as a jump start. I don't know how to contextualize it properly. It just like, it just bam. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous of opportunities that you can imagine. Yeah. 15 year old Avril Lavigne gets to perform on stage with Shania Twain for 20,000 people. Like, I can't imagine how nervous she must have been, how exciting that would have been. She, like, like I said, she loved Shania Twain, like, was a fan of her, everything, like, knew her music and was familiar. And just imagine getting to go perform for a small, like, arena of people with your favorite artist. I don't know if I could do it. I bet you could. I bet you could. Who, who's your favorite artist? Who would you want to? the most to win a contest to go perform with michael buble <laughs> no no not the most elton john that'd be a pretty iconic one phil collins billy joel billy joel would be pretty cool too i wouldn't be able to perform with any of them really <laughs> i know right that's what i'm saying I, I just wouldn't well i mean i'm also like not necessarily interested in a career in performing music that's not like my thing maybe if it was i would be more inclined but whoo it's stressful i think if you got the chance to perform with them and you were good whether you wanted a career in music or not th that door is open <laughs> i feel like it's the thing that people would probably understand if you weren't good right if you go up there and really sell it and have fun with it and just like own it then true. i don't know i think you could have the time of your life but wouldn't you know that was just the beginning a very auspicious significant fast huge beginning for her she was able to take a writing and recording trip to new york city and she got connected with artista records in november of 2000 they invited her to do a 15 minute audition just to hear her sing see if she might be a fit you know just get a feel for things right just like a real hi how are you come on in and, and sing a song and you know we'll give you some career advice right nothing too wild sure she crushed it she blew them away pretty much right there they signed her for a two album 1.25 million dollar contract with a nine hundred thousand dollar publishing advance i like wouldn't that just blow your mind man you're a kid she's like 17 that's that's incredible it's unthinkable that just doesn't happen it's what's gonna happen with my hippin and hoppin album well it's already got a lot of promotion i feel like we've already put a disproportionate weight of marketing behind that album for what it is so far <laughs> Yeah, but someday. Someday. Yeah, it's still in the... If you're wondering, by the way, all these 100 and, what, six episodes <laughs> since we mentioned it? Still in the inspiration phase of songwriting. Yeah. Brainstorming. Waiting for the brain blast, Jimmy Neutron style. Yeah. So Avril gets this contract. And with that contract in hand, she was able to drop out of school, obviously with millions of dollars, to focus on music full time. So she gets to work trying to find her sound and her lyrical voice and really carve out her own niche with the music she's trying to make. It takes a few months. It takes a few long months, very hard at work, but they finally cracked the code and landed on a group of songs that they think will be pretty big hits. And that's what leads straight into her debut record that we're talking about today, Let Go. Woo! Yeah. Let Go was recorded from May of 2001 to March 2002, taking almost a full year at studios all across New York, New Jersey, and California. Eventually, it was officially released in Canada on June 4th, 2002, and worldwide on June 22nd. One of the reasons that it took almost a year to make this album was all the grappling and the wrestling she had to do with her sound. She was trying things one way and another way and another way, and, you know, the label handed her a few things to record, and it just it just wasn't working right. And then they said, okay, well, we've got this production team for you here. We've got this group of people called The Matrix, right? Which is a production trio consisting of Lauren Christie, Graham Edwards, and Scott Spock, who really, like, refine and define her sound. Mm -hmm. They said when they showed up, that Avril wasn't happy but couldn't quite figure out where to go. So they kind of tried this like punk rock Faith Hill direction before they landed on what today honestly is her own unique thing, like the Avril Lavigne sound. I feel like it's kind of the first of many imitators. But that sound is it's this alternative post-grunge pop punk like skater core. I feel like you know it distinctly when you hear it, right? Sure, yeah. Having not heard much of it before, I don't know, but having listened to this album now, I guess, yeah, going forward, I think I'll know it when I hear it. You'll know. Yeah, you'll you'll be clued in now. 
the song that actually first hit the nail on the head for them, the one where they said, that's it, this is huge, that's going to be the song that defines the rest of the sound, was Complicated, which I think you could make the case like that that's the biggest song on this album, and maybe, I mean, top two or three of her entire career thus far, which is it's wild to just get that right out of the gate. Let Go was considered the year's biggest pop debut, and it would actually go on to be the best-selling album of the entire 21st century by a Canadian artist to that point. Obviously, the claim to that title is still ongoing because the 21st century simply has not ended yet. I also think that's an honor that is shared with Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill for the 20th century. I feel like, but I'm not 100% sure, I think Alanis won it in the 20th and Avril's got it in the 21st right now. But Billboard also proclaimed it the 21st bestseller of the entire decade of the 2000s, which is great. To date, it stands as Avril's best-selling record, moving more than 16 million copies around the world. Let Go has gone seven times platinum in the United States, Diamond in Canada, and multi-platinum in several other countries. And in the UK, she actually earned a world record and became the youngest female solo artist to have a number one album in the UK. So I guess it's technically a world record about the UK, which kind of just makes it a UK record, <laughs> I'm realizing, but that's fine. <laughs> also some other fun little nuggets of information about Let Go. She wrote or co-wrote every single track on the album. And you remember when I said her dad converted their basement into a recording studio? I do remember that. Well, one of the things they loved to do in that recording studio was make little karaoke songs. You know, they would take the instrumental tracks and she would sing the karaoke versions of them. Interestingly enough, they kind of structured the recordings for Let Go the same way. The band came in, pretty much wrapped up all the instrumental tracks in full first, and then she came in and just sang her vocal over the rest of the track like she was doing karaoke, which is a really interesting way to do it, but very cool. And I think that gives an advantage to her vocal because it lets her hear exactly what the music is doing behind her and like play to that. She can be a little more flexible dynamically and know exactly where the music is going behind her. Scott Spock said they did five or six takes for every song on the album, but he said probably 90% of what was finally used on the album came from the first or second takes, which once again is like very impressive. To walk in and nail it, it's pretty great. Also, the album's original title was not going to be Let Go. They wanted to call the album Anything But Ordinary, but Avril insisted that they call it Let Go instead, which actually happens to be the title of an unreleased demo that didn't make the cut for the record. Which, until I learned that fact, I always just assumed that Let Go was kind of a play on the opening track, Losing Grip. If you're losing your grip, you know, you're essentially being forced to let go. So I kind of thought that's how it was related or intertwined. And her tour in support of the record, the Try to Shut Me Up tour, they played 70 dates all around the world, and she pretty much played the entire album cover to cover, mixed in a couple different cover songs. She liked to play Green Day's Basket Case and Bob Dylan's Knocking on Heaven's Door, but really, she pretty much toured the album in its entirety, which is awesome. But that's Avril up to and through Let Go. The rest of her career, I mean, is still ongoing and very interesting in its own right, her second album, Under My Skin, was also a huge hit. It came out two years later, after Let Go, in 2004, and it's been certified five times platinum in Canada, more than three times platinum in the United States. It's got songs like My Happy Ending and Nobody's Home, and it sent her on a mall tour where she just showed up unannounced, pretty much, at different malls all across America. Is That's... It's weird, right? That's a new one. It is weird. I guess malls were bigger in 2004. They say the mall's making a comeback. That's what that's what they say. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, what are the odds that she'll do another mall tour? I would go to that. I would too. Well, the problem is if she does it like the last time, you might not get much of a heads up. It might, you know, might be announced the week of, maybe the day of. I'll still make it. You'll make it? Make the trip for Avril Lavigne. How far would you go to watch Avril Lavigne play in a mall? What's your, like, radius? I don't have an exact number, but it'd be significant. Wow. We're talking, like, 300 miles? I can't conceptualize that distance. How far is that? <laughs> That's like from you to me. So I had nothing better to do. Sure. Well, how could you have anything better to do? It's Avril Lavigne in a mall. I mean, I'm just saying I'm not gonna like drop everything I'm doing to go do that necessarily. But or like if I had something else important going on. Right. But I definitely, I definitely go. I'd do that. Did it for Elton John. That's true. Well, he didn't. He didn't exactly play in a mall. He kind of played in a well, state. Yeah. I would. I would drive 300 miles. I'd drop whatever I was doing to go watch Elton John play in a mall. <laughs> really, I would. You're right. I would fly 
to a completely different continent to seal and John play them all. <laughs> it's true. It's just the way it is. I'd be a rocket man to go get there. I would go to the moon to see the rocket man play in the mall on the moon. Dude, I'd be Daniel traveling tonight on a plane. But yeah, yeah, she did a mall tour. We kind of lost the thread there. She did a mall tour. She also, right around 2004, became the world's best-selling Canadian artist. And, did not know this, she also co-wrote Kelly Clarkson's giant hit song, Breakaway, which is another 2002 school bus core memory for me. <laughs> Avril Lavigne has, like, significantly shaped my memories of music before I even knew it. So that was considered a little Wayne effect? Or Maybe. Or is that its own new, is that the, is that the Avril effect? I think, yeah, I think that's the Avril effect. <laughs> Avril's third album from 2007 features another of her biggest songs, another one that I'm pretty sure you would know, Girlfriend, which turned out to be her first U.S. number one single. Do you know Girlfriend? How's that one go? Hey, hey, you, you, I don't I like, like your girlfriend. girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, everybody knows that one. It's another one that I feel like is just used a lot yeah it definitely was and i will be perfectly transparent did not even realize that was avril lavigne for the longest time <laughs> i should have probably i don't think that one's as necessarily punky but i definitely could see it fitting that like skater core vibe girlfriend also charted in the top two in five other countries and she recorded versions in seven other languages so maybe that's part of the reason that it was like mega popular is because i mean it had eight translations <laughs> She's also done work on movie soundtracks. Her work appeared in Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland from 2010, the one with Johnny Depp. Heck yeah. Yeah. By 2013, she'd release her next two albums, and then she took a little bit of a break for six-ish years, at least from albums. You know, she still did a little performing and collaborating with other artists. But during that time, she was actually fighting Lyme disease which is like rare and she actually did successfully recover from it but that was the era you know where she was working with that but she returned back to music into the album releasing scene in 2019 with a record head above water and I remember her making an even bigger splash lately in 2022 with Love Sucks, like S-U-X, like the cool way to spell sucks. And that's because she was signed to Elektra Records for that album. She worked very extensively with Blink-182's Travis Barker to write and record the album, who, I mean, we've also talked about another very Travis Barker heavy album way, way back in the day, Machine Gun Kelly Tickets to My Downfall on episode 9. <laughs> We're really pulling both ends of the podcast together right now. It's also been confirmed that her eighth studio album is in the works, so keep an eye out for that sometime in the future, or in the past if you're listening to this episode in the future, because apparently you just never know anymore. As far as her awards and accolades go, what a career. She was and is still one of the foremost artists in pop punk, and she's had a huge influence on everybody from Billie Eilish to Olivia Rodrigo to Ed Sheeran to Phoebe Bridgers. In 2003... Complicated won an International Achievement Award at Canada's SoCan Awards, and in the span of two years, she earned eight Grammy nominations, including Best New Artist. She's been nominated for four American Music Awards, a ton of Billboard Awards, and a lot more. She has 10 Juno Awards, which, you know, are Canadian Grammy equivalents. She's got three Teen Choice Awards, 23 MTV Awards. In total, she's earned 155 major awards on 338 major award nominations, which is a really solid 45% win rate. Pretty good. It's pretty good, right? I know. If only I'd won 45% of the awards I've been up for, my life could be 55% better. Well, that math doesn't make sense. That's, we I said that math that. doesn't work out. <laughs> the <laughs> well, squirrels are shaking it, their head no on that it one. It could work out depending on how many, <laughs> on what my win percentage is right now. It's about what the mixtapers win percentage is. It's true. It's not great. Also, I remember way back on episode 58, we talked about, I think the mixtaper talked about how Wham! with George Michael and Andrew Ridgely, they became the first Western group to perform in China. Sure. But Avril Lavigne was the first artist to execute an entire tour in China with her 2008 tour. So that's cool. Wham paved the way. For Avril. They whammed so Avril could let go. <laughs> I just like using wham as a verb. <laughs> It's too fun. Do you remember on episode 100 how we talked about the Paul is dead conspiracy where everyone thought Paul McCartney passed away and was replaced by a lookalike? Yep. This happened again with Avril Lavigne. This was another widespread internet conspiracy that she died and had been replaced 
In 2011, a Brazilian blog popped up that said she was replaced in 2003, just after she released Let Go. Oh, so regardless of this being true or not, we got the real Avril. Oh, yeah. Let Go Avril is absolutely real, regardless of whether she died and was replaced. Gotcha. But she wasn't. But she wasn't. (laughs) People say that a doppelganger named Melissa took her place. I can't believe they get things so specific. Wow, the doppelganger has got a name. Yeah, yeah, because she wrote Melissa on her hand one time, I guess, because she feels guilty about it, Mm. right? She feels guilty that she took Avril Lavigne's place. So instead of coming out and just saying, hey, Avril Lavigne died a long time ago and I've been posing as her, I'm so sorry. What she does instead is she just leaves little clues (laughs) all throughout the music, a little breadcrumb trail for only the most dedicated fans to notice. She feels guilty about it, but not guilty enough to give up the life. No, just guilty enough to like, I feel like I should tell people, you know, I feel like someone should know, but maybe she's all, maybe she's like signed an NDA, very contractually obligated to have an alter ego. (laughs) I don't know. People are so wild. I can't believe it. And as a matter of fact, you know, that started in 2011. Avril didn't hear about it at all until she was directly asked during a 2014 interview. Oh, wow. Like, live, the interviewer said, Hey, people have been saying you're dead. Are you Melissa? (laughs) She's like, what? (laughs) Like, how confusing that moment must have been. (laughs) But that's all I've got to say for the matter. It's time for me to let go of the mic and hand the hosting duties for the next several facts over to... About to say, don't let go of the mic, just let go of the hosting duties. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, symbolically, symbolically, I'm handing the mic over to the mixtaper so he can host the next segment of the podcast, a little game show that we here at Back Palm Enterprises like to call Fact or Spin. Not symbolically. Actually, I'm now handing the microphone over to the mixtaper. Right, literally. Not figuratively. Actually, literally. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. He, uh, psychologically. Oh, I was waiting for that sentence to continue. <laughs> it just took a long pause. I don't know. You're here psychologically? I was trying to think something other than literal or, or symbolically. So, like, like, psychologically. Psychologically? Physically? Yeah. You're present. I don't know. Well, my present to you this week, hopefully... A win? ...will be a 50-50 week. Well, no, no. I, I need to win a couple now because our 50-50 for the year is thrown off. Okay, 50-50 for the year is a little bit off. But not by much. Which means I need to be going for a win. Look, we've done pretty well. Uh, Otis was 50-50. Taylor Swift was a battle. We've been doing worse at 50-50 since we've been trying to do 50-50 than when we were at each other's throats. You're right. It's a real (laughs) conundrum. I, I can't figure it out yet. Think I'm taking it too easy on you. I sure hope not. I think when I tried harder, you know, they ended up 50-50 more. And now you're getting too many easy wins. Gonna have to pull out some dastardly tricks. Bring the score back. Maybe. Mixtaper, I'm worried about this week. Yeah? Because full transparency, uh, Connor told me that I already found some of the things you were gonna bring as factor spins during my first little round of information. Sure did. Which made me dive even deeper I know. into the enigma that is Arrow Levine. I hope she's not too enigmatic, but uh, let's find out. Let's find out out she's anything but ordinary that's for sure she has a lifetime supply of stealth a lifetime supply of stealth now is the fun part of the show where i get to interpret what you say (laughs) now to me a lifetime supply of stealth i mean in my brain what's more stealthy than camouflage oh yeah does avril lavigne have like some kind of camouflage sponsorship or something is, <laughs> is that what this is about no camouflage is not where i went okay there's something more stealthy than camouflage i mean like ninjas more stealthy than ninjas she has more than a lifetime supply of ninjas <laughs> <laughs> what could it be what what does she have here what's stealthy yeah i don't even know like stealth bombers <laughs> like the planes that fly really high that's what it is she has it she has her own air depot filled with nothing but stealth bombers <laughs> wow i'm gonna i'm gonna call that one a spin uh what is what is it really a lifetime supply of sneakers oh so, uh, <laughs> that's funny i love that so a sneaker sponsorship uh not really sponsorship does she win them has she what's she done to receive this she was given them by whom by sneaker brand osiris okay that's i mean that's kind of a sponsorship not really by the brand that was the brand of sneakers she got i don't know if she really got them from osiris you'll understand why i'm confused when you get a little deeper okay well before we go too deep i want to know if she like these lifetime supply things always have some kind of like monkey's 
paw style condition with them. Like you get a <laughs> lifetime supply of like razor blades, but you really only get one every six months for the rest of your life or something like stupid. Mm. So like, wh- does she get all the shoes at once? And it's just theoretically enough pairs of shoes to last a lifetime. Yeah, no. Yeah, she got a bunch of pair of shoes at once, and she said it was more than she would need for the rest of her life. Well, you, that's awful. Wh- how many? I don't know. Don't have an exact number for you. Okay, but, like, not even an estimate? Enough to last her the rest of her life. Okay, yeah. Assuming your feet don't really grow anymore. Well. Which I guess after a certain point. Do your feet grow a lot after you become an adult? I mean, I don't think so. How'd she get these? She got them from the mall where Complicated was shot, the music video. No. Okay. She got them from the mall where they shot the complicated music video. Yeah. But who are they from? If they're not from Osiris. That's what I don't know. Like, does Osiris have stores in the mall? Or is this just a store in the mall who was like, here, have all these Osiris shoes? That's what I really don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's where I got confused. I don't know. I've frankly never really heard of Osiris, but I'm not too big into shoes. I'm not one of those like sneakerhead people. And has she been using them? Like, is that what she wears all the time? Typically? Gosh, I would hope so. How do you how do you store that many? I don't know. Wow. Why'd they have to go and make things so complicated? (laughs) Any other questions? Oh, gosh, so many. I don't even know what to ask. So I'm going to say this is true. Locking in true. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sticking with true. I'm just, I'm just a little fuzzy on some of the details. Avril Lavigne seems like a sneakers type of gal. You know, it seems like a thing she'd be into. And I think a lifetime supply of sneakers is like, that's smart. You know, it's better than some of the other weird endorsements. So you said you're locking in true? Oh, I don't know. Oh. No, but the feet growing thing has got me now. Like when you're an adult, I guess your feet don't grow. But when she shot the complicated music video, she was still like a young teenager. I feel like my feet stopped growing like once I hit high school. I feel like I've been the same size since high school, but I don't know. I don't know. I gotta stick to my guns though. I'm feeling like I should switch. This is gonna be one of the weeks where I think my gut throws me off, but I'm gonna lock to true and stick to my guns here. Locking in true. This is a spin. <laughs> so it is. Should have listened to that gun. I should have. Wow, I really. Should've. I stayed. I stay cool under pressure there. With uh, didn't try to rush you into locking in when I felt you wavering. You didn't. That's true. You're learning, and that's scary. You're like an ever evolving like <laughs> game AI, but like real eye. I have one real eye in my name and two real eyes on my head. It's true. Behind this mask. Wow. You got three real eyes. (laughs) So, another fun (laughs) fact about me. (laughs) Hey, you know what? Add it to the cannon. Getting to know you a little better. (laughs) Now, she did get a free pair of Osiris sneakers when she recorded the complicated video at the mall, but not a lifetime supply. Wow. A free pair makes... A lot more sense. Yeah. Well, but if it's a really, really good pair, it could be a lifetime supply. It could be a lifetime. What if that's all the Osiris sneakers she needed in her life? I want to contest that. Oh, uh, well, get her on record saying that that, was, that one pair of shoe was a lifetime supply. And I'll give it to you. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll report back. All right. What's up next? She accidentally gave away a prized possession. Oh, no. I'm having images of Beyonce chucking her earrings into the crowd. <laughs> Accidentally gave away a possession that was prized by her. Like, something she loved? Yes. Oh, what was it? The shirt she was wearing when she performed with Shania Twain. Oh, the 15-year-old one? Yep. Oh, that's tough. That's cool. And so, okay, that is starting to make a little more sense. I'm like, how can you accidentally give away something you prize? But... I mean, there's a lot. If it's a shirt that you've had for a long time in the closet, maybe it gets mixed in with the clothes you're sending to Goodwill or like getting rid of. That could happen. Maybe it's a hand-me-down. Maybe someone else finds it, you know, and it's like someone in your household and is like, oh. (laughs) Say what? No, it was like, mom's like, why are we still holding on to this t-shirt? It's gross and smells like concert sweat. I'm going to (laughs) put this in a bag. Like it gets Toy Story 3'd, right? She needs to take it to the attic and it gets taken to Goodwill. But how does this happen? I'm speculating on a lot of different things. I'd rather just hear you say it. You hit on it in there in one of your speculations. Well, I said a lot of things. It could be anything. (laughs) Yeah, it ended up in a box she was getting rid of on accident. Didn't realize it till after the fact. So did she put it there? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Accidentally. Put it in the wrong box. She realizes it's gone. First of all, how does she realize it's gone so, like, what's the time frame? Uh... I don't know how she realized it was gone, but she says she said a couple months. 
so okay two months maybe three months okay so i thought i mean from the sound of it initially i was like it it, it kind of sounded like she got home went oh shoot where's oh, my no. concert shirt from 1999 where'd it go and then like ran back to the goodwill and like had to buy it back off the shelf nope. it sounds like she donated it got rid of it and just it's gone now yeah i don't know if she donated it or just threw the clothes out but yeah it's gone tragic so someone out there might have it or it might have had it at one point yeah maybe or it's in a dump somewhere. Yeah, it's in a dump. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a spin. This is a spin. Oh, I don't know, though. Oh, he doesn't know, though. Here's what's messing me up now. <laughs> now I'm in my own head about how you had to replace all of your facts. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, would you have just made a bunch of spins really quick? Or did you actually find more facts that you didn't find the first time? I don't know. It's for you and your heart to decide. My heart... I'm feeling like this. I've got some red flags here <laughs> because you said she accidentally gave away a prize possession and we ended with, I don't know if it's in the dump. Well, I mean, is that still giving it away? Giving it away to nature? <laughs> well, I just, yeah. Giving I it mean, away to the ravage of time, Yeah, I guess. I'm going to say spin. Just lock it in spin. Yes. That feels like the kind of thing you wouldn't keep with the rest of your clothes at a certain point. Like you'd have it like set aside or in a shadow box or something. I don't know. I don't know. This is... A spin. Yes. Yes. So the spin. Did you make a mistake and forget that you said she gave it away and then say it ended up in a dump? No, no, that was just, that's how I chose to word the fact. Oh, that was just. Really had nothing to do with it. Just lucky for me. Yep. Next up, she's been down the rabbit hole. Well, so I'm drawn back to Alice in Wonderland. Correct. Obviously. So she does music for the movie and for the soundtrack album. Yep, sure. What's your fact here? How's she been down the rabbit hole? Well, other than writing the music that you already uh, definitely said in your rundown. Of course. She also helped design a clothing line inspired by the movie. Ooh, that's cool. A lot of clothing-based facts this week. Yeah. We're kind of three for three on apparel. Yeah. What? <laughs> what's the clothing line called? It's a great question. It is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, it is called. It is called Abby Dawn Collection. The Abby mm. Dawn Collection. Okay. Your confidence and thorough knowledge certainly inspires confidence. <laughs> there was definitely no time to lay there. <laughs> <laughs> So what's it look like? Alice in Wonderland's a pretty trippy story. I mean, there's a lot happening in all versions of it. How's that translate into clothes? Let's see. It's just uh, there's some t-shirts, some graphic tees, and some denim stuff featuring different like slogans from the movie, like a shirt that said shrink me on it. <laughs> That's funny. Is it, <laughs> is it all cotton? That's a very funny shirt. That'd be really funny if it was all cotton. I would honestly just <laughs> buy a shirt like that that's like really small <laughs> like ridiculously small there was some pinstripe suspenders and a pink bow tie so a lot that's a lot of different kinds of clothing yeah it's not just like one no it's a whole like clothing line oh yeah yeah but it's not like one style or like a line of t-shirts or a line of denim jackets or whatever no 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 of course not i'm having my doubts First of all, the name thing is already a red flag. What's wrong with the name? What? Abby, what? Abby. Uh, Abby Dawn. Abby Dawn. Why is it called that? I didn't even ask. Uh. <laughs> it's not really an Abby in Alice in Wonderland. I mean, character's name is very clearly Alice. That is the lifestyle brand that Avril Lavigne does stuff under. Okay, so like... So it's like a sub version of an existing, like Dawn yeah. is like the collection. Exactly. Okay. Don't question my names. How dare you? Well, no, I've got more to question. I also, this is a detail thing, and I also might be off base. I don't think shrink me as a phrase appears in Alice in Wonderland, right? There's the bottle, there's, <laughs> there's drink me, and the like the oh. cookie that's like oh. eat me, and it does cause her to shrink and grow. <laughs> but I really don't think shrink me as a slogan oh. is used, and I also don't think <laughs> that it would make any sense on a t-shirt. Your rebuttal? You got nothing to say. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. Give me your answer. <laughs> well, I'm gonna say that one's a spin. I I think I've got some questions here. Oh, definitely didn't miss that the Alice in Wonderland thing was in your rundown uh, until after I said it. Definitely not another victim. Definitely didn't do that. Not another victim of things that I found that you didn't realize that I found. <laughs> oh, no. Definitely not. 
no that's definitely what happened i uh missed that you knew she did the music for the alice in wonderland thing mm -hmm. but luckily off of a quick google found that this is a true fact <laughs> is it really? This is a true fact. Avril Lavigne's Abbey Dawn collection jumps down the rabbit hole with Alice in Wonderland inspired line. There's a shirt that says Shrink Me. Featured special details that incorporate Wonderland. The collection consists of Abbey Dawn's best selling styles, including graphic tees and denim, soft jersey vintage burnout tees illustrating the iconic stopwatch graphic paired with a feminine ruffle touch. Other tees featuring sayings such as At Least We Love Each Other with Spade and Fleur de Lis detailing cream pinstripe twill shorts with black suspenders and a pink bow also feature a complimenting hooded jacket with a shrink me silk screen wow rounding out the collection are abby don's boyfriend jeans with suspenders and black jersey and a pink printed silk tan dress with exposed zipper price ranges from 28 dollars for printed tees up to 54 dollars for denim and it was apparently a kohl's exclusive i'm pretty mad I'm pretty mad. Shrink Me <laughs> is not canon to Alice in Wonderland. This line is nonsensical. Unreal. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I think I sold my lack of knowledge pretty well. You did. You did. It's Drink Me and it's Eat Me. Avril Lavigne, if you're listening to this, flip and <laughs> fix it. Retcon that. <laughs> Put out a recall. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. And everyone's going to be like, oh no, that shirt. I wore it with Shania Twain 15 years ago. I threw it away. Honestly, <laughs> that's what I want. Justice for Alice. But going into the final ramp with a good one, she can play dead. <laughs> yes, yeah, she can. Now to me, can I just, can you confirm if this is true or not? I, th I think this is almost the title that you wanted to use when you maybe were going to lie about the conspiracy theory that she had been killed and replaced with a lookalike and you just like the title so much that you whatever this is you made it fit can neither confirm nor deny that okay she can play dead like <laughs> what's that mean like lie very still well what do you think of when you think of playing dead well i think of a dog being trained to play dead oh okay what's your second guess what's the, what's the second thing that pops in your brain when you hear play dead rapid fire what's the second thing that pops in your brain i don't know is there a second thing there should be that sounds like a threat. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. What classic animal plays dead without needing any training? Oh, like a possum. A possum. Oh, yes. this is a fact about the time that she played that possum in Over the Hedge with Steve Carell. Sure is. What's the fact? She played a possum in Over the Hedge with Steve Carell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's the other possum. What's her name? Um, uh, oh, I... I can't remember, but I know that he does the whole, like, Stella thing as he pretends to be dying, like he does. But that's, like, her dad, Possum. Man. Oh, man. Well, before you say anything else, I'm going to know it's a fact. I'm going to say it's a fact. No lies in here. Before you give me a chance to put any lies yeah, in it. Yeah, that's why I cut you off before you could answer about her name. <laughs> this is a fact. I guess we're 50-50. What a wild ride. What a great movie. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen Over the Hedge. One of my favorite animated movies. Honestly, it's great. And I always constantly think of the slogan for the Spuddies chips. Enough is never enough. Uh -huh. And I want to quote it and like reference that so much, but I think it's too niche and other people around me will not get it. If you're out there and you remember Spuddies, enough is never enough. Like validate me. <laughs> Let me know. I, one I quote a lot is the, but I want the cookie. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm a crazy <laughs> rabid squirrel was my first encounter with the concept of rabies. <laughs> I mean, really, what a what a movie. Yeah, she uh, voices Heather. Heather, the, that's it. The possum, the teenage daughter possum. That's right. William Shatner is her father. Yeah. Bruce Willis is RJ in that, the raccoon, by the way. Not something I realized. Is he really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, Steve Carell is Hammy the squirrel. Mm-hmm. Wow, I can't believe you chose to end with Over the Hedge. Well, it's because I thought I had the funniest title. Oh, it does. She can play dead. And it was originally going to be my title I had for... <laughs> yup. <laughs> you were right. I was like, I want to still use that. I was like, I know she's in Over the Hedge. And she plays dead like a possum. Wow, what a weird coincidence that you were able to use it so well for both. Yeah. I really couldn't think of a second play dead thing. Yeah, that's kind of sad. I know. That was a wild ride. Wow, I'm glad you had to replace all those. Yeah. Imagine what this would have been otherwise, is you being disappointed as I nailed this. And we went 
50. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We also did exactly the same 50-50 as last week where I missed the first one and got the second and fourth. Can't believe you knew she was in over the hedge. I was, you hardly ever know stuff about movies. Just literally mentioned that earlier this episode. That's true. You're right. I, <laughs> I did. Well, maybe I know more than I think. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, when it comes to factor spin 50-50s, enough is never enough. I'm out of here. I can tell I'm unwanted. No, you're wanted. You're wanted. Until tomorrow. Yeah. What? No, until past yeah. tomorrow. Oh, well, he's gone. I think that's a reference to the fact that he knows we're recording it again tomorrow. For the audience, it'll be until next week. Uh-huh, yes. But. Yes. Well, that was fun. Hi, Connor. Welcome back. I am back. Do you remember Over the Hedge? I love that movie. Me and the mixtaper watch it at least once a year together. Oh, <laughs> did not know that. That's what he likes to watch on his birthday. Don't tell the mixtaper this. And he didn't use it, so this is okay. So this is in the clear. I just needed it to be in the episode, and I knew it could be a thing that came up for Factor Spin. And especially after what already happened, where he had to replace all his facts, I, I didn't want to do another faux pas, so I wanted to spare his feelings. But in 2004, Avril Lavigne recorded a version of the SpongeBob SquarePants theme song for the SpongeBob movie. Yeah. It is so wild. I listened to it. I could not believe it. It's real. Yeah. Let's talk about the album cover of Let Go. Really? <laughs> I don't have much to say. The album cover is a picture of Avril taken in Manhattan, New York, at the intersection of Broadway and Canal Street. It's a very 2002 album cover. Sure is. The background is all blurry as everything moves around her, but she is stationary and defiant. Also, with, like that font. That font looks like it's <laughs> carved into a desk in a high school. Which I feel like is what she's going for. I, it is. It is. And it works. Real punky. Yeah. I think it's a good album cover for this record, to be honest. It captures the time period and the energy of it very well. Also, fun fact, when the 20th anniversary of this album came out in 2022 she went back to the same place and recreated the cover in a little video they made for the promo that is cool but let's get into it we got 13 tracks to talk about today and it all kicks off with track one losing grip starting to slip losing her grip i actually think i encountered that avril likes losing my grip better than complicated because she wrote it or at least more directly contributed to it hmm. you know complicated had a lot of co-writing and help from the matrix or production team and stuff and losing grip was really like her brainchild and she loved it it was also the album's fourth single i think losing grip is a great opening track it's really like chef's kiss perfection it's angsty it's emotional it's bold it's vulnerable but with a real punk edge right you left me alone and i was hurt it was painful i was afraid but why should i care why should i even give you the time of day i'm better off without you it's so perfect yeah it's this whole album shoved up into the first track i didn't realize i knew this song until i got to the chorus really i i think the chorus is obviously the memorable part of the song it's got a couple big really sweeping moments in it especially at the beginning why should i care you know that's huge it hits hard i don't think i did know this song before listening to the album i did do you know why nope oh wow i'm sure it was in something almost definitely i like the chorus a lot i also really really like the bridge where everything scales back and is crying out loud you know it's it's very weepy and i love crying out loud i'm crying out loud like the double meaning there like <laughs> Good grief, I weep, you know? For crying out loud, I'm crying out loud. It's clever. It just scratches the itch perfectly. And it explodes into those last choruses afterwards. Losing Grip is a solid song. I think this album, I'll be honest, it's probably a little front-loaded with big hits and great tracks. There's a lot in the back half to like, and it's not totally, like, sparse. But definitely the highest concentration of stuff that I'm, like, super psyched to talk about is early. Yeah. Losing Grip, I think I put it at the upper end of the middle part of this album for me. Okay. I think. Interesting. I'm, I haven't broken it down by the numbers yet, but that's roughly where it goes. Upper half of the middle third. I don't know. Should I make that more simple? Is that too complicated? <laughs> See what you did there. Yeah, why did I have to go and make things so complicated? Let's talk about it. Track two. Track two. Is this not one of the greatest songs to come out from this 2000s era? Like the early 2000s? I feel like Complicated, it's on a short list of songs that I would put on, you know, my top whatever's from the 2000s. So this is the song that makes me go, okay, yeah, I don't, the, I don't like your girlfriend song. It fits with Avril Lavigne. Yeah. Like Losing Grip... If you played only Losing Grip and said, oh, hey, here's another song by this person and played me the girlfriend song, I'd be like, whoa, what the heck? But after now hearing Complicated, I'm like, yes, now that makes sense. Yeah, Losing Grip's a little bit too dark and moody and 
like intense i think for what girlfriend kind of turns into eventually yeah complicated like is also intense but it's faster it's brighter it's got more of that pop vibe very pop vibe i think this is like a like a crossover hit really yeah it definitely showed in the numbers this you know is a song that identified her sound kicked off her career and just like defined became a staple of pop punk in a lot of ways. It spent 16 consecutive weeks on top of the Billboard Top 40 charts and peaked at number two on the Hot 100. Today, it's a three million seller around the world. And it's so good. That hook is such an earworm. Honestly, this song sounds like it could have been a Taylor Swift song, like as she was transitioning from her country to her pop oh. <laughs> style, you know? Like this like almost fits in that niche area. Yeah, if she decided to make Reputation like it was Fearless complicated would be on it yeah <laughs> it's true and it's such a great song thematically too it feels understandable at a very fundamental level why do you make things complicated why do you pretend to be something you're not you're exhausting and you're frustrating and i'm over it like that's yeah, great and again it's so nostalgic for me it's like just so hard burned into my memory i recognize the song instantly from the first second i hit play even when i picked up this album after not ever really actively seeking out Avril Lavigne or her music. Complicated started, and I was like straight up just on the school bus again. I was like worried about my homework all of a sudden. What happened? <laughs> and beyond the iconic music, right? The lyrics in the song are 100% on point always. You fall and you crawl and you break and you take what you get and you turn it into honesty and promise me I'm never going to find you fake it. Like holy run on sentence, Batman. But it just yeah. it just rolls off the tongue and it rides the wave of that melody with like such grace when it should be so much clunkier just to like read the words and to think it through in my brain that should not work and it could not work any better this is one of the ones i was talking about that i feel like gets used a lot as like sound bites for things oh, so or, much you know i feel like i see this put on people's like like on reddit posts on certain subreddits where people like somebody will be venting about something and somebody will just write why'd you have to go and make it so complicated <laughs> <laughs> we should bring it back we should uh we should start a new wave of complicated memes us like discussing the moon Watch you have to go in and make yeah. it so complicated. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The moon era. <laughs> I feel like we forced it with Otis Redding, right? Are we still in the moon era? Well, I've brought it up twice this episode, but both times were kind of not on purpose. They just were natural bring up. So I don't know. Because I brought it up earlier when I said that I would go to the moon to see Elton John. Oh, you're perform. right. <laughs> you did. I didn't even think about that. I didn't think about it either until later. It's funny that you didn't force that. <laughs> yeah. I say why not? The moon era is, you know, it's, it's a state of being. It's ever evolving. I told you we're just in a new moon phase where like we might not talk about it as much. But it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. It's just, it's just darker. Let's talk about track three, Skater Boy. Like S-K-8-E-R boy, <laughs> B-O-I. Man, do you remember T9 texting? Do you remember when you had to hit seven four times to type an S on your phone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what Skater Boy reminds me of. It makes me think of every time. I used to be really fast at that, I think, at one point in my life. Same. But now I couldn't tell you the last time that I used it, ever. Yeah. But that used to be a whole skill. It's like people who are like, you know, like, I don't know, our parents' age or older who like were really good at like the rotary phone dialing. Oh gosh, yeah. And now like nobody knows how to do that. I think three-year-old me could like work a VCR better than current me can. Yeah. 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 Definitely that <laughs> kind of vibes. This is another song though that gets in text form. I see it a lot, but like parodied with different words. Like the, he was a boy, she was a girl but like used with other things. Yes. Could I make it any more obvious? <laughs> Actually, I can kind of remember the last time I used T9 and that <laughs> that's when I made our Spin It phone number because I wanted a cool phone number that was like unique to Spin It, but I didn't want to set up a real number. The main seven digit part of our phone number is Spin It. That's awesome. That's the last time I used T9. Anyway, that's the tangent. Anyway. T9 tangent. But it -na 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 -na. Yeah. <laughs> like here. Like, she was a Spotify premium girl. He was a YouTube uh, boy sort of thing. <laughs> Can I make it any more obvious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just random analogies, random comparisons of, of things. And that's so funny. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. Could she have made it any more obvious, though? He was a boy. She was a girl. Is that as obvious as it gets? I feel like it's not. <laughs> 
I think it was pretty obvious. It seems obvious in retrospect, but we can say that because we listened to the whole thing. Skater Boy was a big hit. It made it to number 10 on the Billboard charts and is two times platinum in the U.S. And like I said, Complicated, I think, was a bit of a crossover hit into pop. But Skater Boy feels like, I mean, just like losing grip. Skater Boy is for the real ones, you know? And it's actually very true to form. Avril was a skater herself, and she fell in with that crowd as a teenager which is one of the big motivators that helped her develop this signature sound and this style and everything. Her whole aesthetic was inspired by being a part of skater culture. So Skater Boy is a really cool song. And she actually said, Skater Boy is a super special song to me. I wrote it about my high school experience, like different groups and cliques and stuff. And I was obsessed with skaters and skater boys. And so what that translates into in this song is she sets it up almost like a Romeo and Juliet type song about two kids from different worlds who are crushing hard on each other. You know, he likes her and she likes him and they can't talk about it. Their friends are pretty judgy about it. You know, they're telling them not to go for it. And unlike Romeo and Juliet, the twist that she puts on this little tale is they don't end up together. This girl is too afraid of the consequences. And she says, see you later, boy. So the skater boy goes on and gets famous as a musician, much to the chagrin of his former crush, who wishes she made different choices. And the twist of all twists, as if the song needed any more twists... <laughs> It gets a second level when, in the bridge, the narrator has become the new girlfriend and is rubbing it in the first girl's face. Like, don't you wish you had what I have? Like, what a way to punch down, <laughs> honestly. Like, the reason that this song exists is so that she can mock the first girl, which I think is hilarious and very well done. That she's able to, like, write herself into the story that we kind of expect to go a whole different way, and then she, like, subverts it so hard. She's the one that ends up with the dream guy, even though she said, see you later, boy, like we think it's talking about the main character. No, the main character is Avril all along. Yeah, it's a real good twist. Isn't it though? I also like that it's just a song that tells a complete story. We start when they're kids and like barely aware of each other and we end, I mean years, years in the future when all the conflicts have been resolved and you know the girl that said see you later like has a kid. <laughs> also the production on Skater Boy is tight. It's crisp, but it's really well balanced. It's toy. Yeah. I feel like the autotune kind of pulls on her voice in a noticeable way on Skater Boy, but it kind of works. I'm not really complaining about it, just noticing it. Also, as of 2022, she was working very, very seriously on making a Skater Boy movie. Weird. Yeah, well, I don't think there's any further word necessarily on when that might come out, but she really wants it. Like, they were putting together a team of directors and cast. Like, you might get to see the Skater Boy movie. Although, I feel like we know how it ends now. But I think you're right, though. It is a little weird. I'm with you. I'm also with me. Can you be with yourself? That's a philosophical question we haven't ever <laughs> touched. Yeah. I think the answer is no. I think the answer is yes, because you can be at war with yourself, which means you can be against yourself. Oh. And if you can be against yourself, then you can be with yourself. Either I'm with me or I'm against me. <laughs> well, lucky for us, Avril does not have to worry about either of those possibilities, because track four is not I'm with me. Track four is I'm with you. It's also ballad time. I think we're a little overdue for a ballad on this album. Yeah. It's a good one. Isn't it, though? It was the third single, hit number four on the Billboard Hot 100, and that made it her third top ten single. It's impressive. Is this one that you knew, or was this a surprise? I think it was a surprise. It didn't ring any bells, mm -hmm. but that is, I'm, I'm not going to commit. Nobody's going to call you out on it. Nobody's going to listen to this and be like, <laughs> no, uh I remember he knew that song. I mean, you never know. Somebody might who listens might go, we used to listen to that song all the time back in middle school and i'd be like oh you're so right i don't know <laughs> maybe our our one avril lavigne loving friend that we mentioned earlier is gonna <laughs> yeah. come at you guns yeah. a blazing you definitely know i'm with you <laughs> exactly <laughs> well i didn't know it that's for sure i will commit to that and it just hits you in the face like a bucket of cold water you know what i mean it's so good that chorus just like strikes you she's singing about being alone but following her path with this unknown guide to try and find a place where she belongs you know the whole like main hook of the song is i don't know who you are but i'm with you like i'm gonna follow the next steps blindly and trust where they lead it's just incredible I, the chorus is amazing it, it really strikes the most emotional chords you've probably got especially after she's primed us for punk in the last three tracks you know yeah you kind of like get in that attitude that angsty mood and then this song hits and you're just like oh 
Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't you mean yeah, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's also a song that's very near and dear to her personally, especially during concerts. She said, it's my favorite, and I always feel like I can connect with the audience on it when I'm performing. And that's got to be... Wow, that's got to be awesome. This is like the, well, I was going to say put your lighters up song, but who has a lighter at a concert now? Put your phone <laughs> flashlights up. It's a little bit different of a vibe. Yeah. Probably back in 2002, there were lighters. Now you got to put your vapes up. I don't think that has, that doesn't have the same effect. <laughs> they don't light up. No, but a vape user just looks for any excuse to pull it out, so. Just to show it off. Just so everybody else knows. Sure. Sorry, I went on some vape hate right there. You did. Oh, man. I wish I'd done that one song from now because I could have said uh, that was probably unwanted, but said I have to say that was probably mobile. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> I feel like this song would be so intimate in a concert. I mean, vapes, lighters, phone, flashlights, whatever you got up. Intimate is how this would be. Put something up. You got something up. Whatever you're doing during this song, you got something up. Your firstborn. <laughs> Wave your babies in the air. <laughs> also, Rihanna sampled this song. On her own song called Cheers, she took the little yeah yeahs in the bridge and gave the co-writing credit on that song to writers on this song. So Avril has some co-writing credits on Rihanna's Cheers. Noise. The yeah yeahs are so good. What a bridge. What It's like wordless, but yeah yeah. Yeah yeah. Yeah yeah, very good. Up next is Mobile. Yeah, she's so good at just hitting a chorus, too. And I think that's evident on this song, where I couldn't care less for this song except for the chorus. <laughs> yeah, it took a bit. Mobile, I think, takes some warming up, too. I mean, you only got to listen to it once. Yeah. When I listened to the album, you know, for the first time, several times in a month, I did not love it at first. And by the end, it grew on me. And that was like months and months ago. I mean, we're coming back to this album now for this episode. And the first time I listened to it, I was like, I had to go through that process a whole other time because it had been so long. And now it's grown on me enough. Like I've listened to the rest of the album enough to know properly where Mobile fits into it. But it's obviously, it just has to be the worst out of the first five tracks all around. And that kind of makes it hit different when you catch it in order the first time through this album. I just like the hit on the chorus. Everything's changing. changing. <laughs> so good. It is. It's different. You know, it starts out with this acoustic guitar. Kind of like this classic four chord rambling pop blues kind of thing. But then the chorus straight up, it just rips the bandaid off. And it gets, I think, a little uncomfortably big for the vibe that we've established. But... In that sense, I mean, it makes it feel like it really blows past the boundaries of the song when she hits the chorus. Mobile's all about being on the move and the instability that comes with constant change. She says, I can't say when I'll be home again. You know, it's time to turn my back on everything. It's all out of her control. And I, I'm such a mobile. It's such an interesting chunk of phrase because I, this is like an Eric Church type thing, right? Remember we talked about how he nounifies all kinds of words? Like he takes something that's not usually in my mind a noun and then turns it into one. Yeah. Like doing this till my down goes up, whatever, nounifying it. She does that with mobile because like mobile is a noun. It just makes me think of the little like baby distraction device that you put on a crib. <laughs> <laughs> to keep them engaged. Yeah. And it feels really juvenile in my head, but I'm pretty sure that's not the context she's trying to invoke here. She's trying to just say, I'm transient. She's not trying to say she's just spinning around a baby sleeping in its crib? No, she's not. That'd be weird. She's just on the move. She's just going. I like this song even less now. I know. It's the firstborn <laughs> that you held up. She's, she's mobile around it. I also think one of the big problems mobile suffers from is it doesn't bring anything new or exciting to the table musically. Everything that mobile does, we've seen to some degree in the first four tracks already. So I think it's the least impressive song so far by a good bit. Also interesting, mobile had a music video that never got released. It was lost or, you know, forgotten about. And then it was discovered and put out into the world one way or another after a decade. So far... Out of the first five tracks, I think Mobile has been my most unwanted song. But that's all about to change. Oh, gosh. With track six, <laughs> Unwanted. Not a big fan of Unwanted, or no. is that just a joke? That's just a joke. Mostly that's just for the sake of an easy transition and a funny phrase. Although I'm also not the biggest fan of Unwanted. It's kind of the hardest song yeah. so far, right? Unwanted feels like the most, I'm about to punch a hole in the wall kind of song. Yeah. <laughs> like I really need to vent my frustration and my anger. That's what Unwanted is. Heck yeah. Yeah, and I think part of that feeling is due to this melody on Unwanted that's so disorienting and it kind of feels built 
to fit the chord progression instead of coexisting naturally with the chords. I think the melody, especially on the verses, is kind of forced to get us to the chorus. The chord progression seems so familiar. The boom, boom, boom. Like, I don't, there's just something about it that seems so familiar. I couldn't place it. That's because it's just half steps and like chromatic notes. You, you could recognize that because... That's everywhere. Yeah, but like the emphasis that it had. Like, sure, they're doing they do that everywhere, but like the specific use of it in this song felt super familiar. Yeah, that's fair. It's cool. The chorus is such an interesting vehicle in this song. You know, it starts out in the intro with some little like techie beep boop kind of things, which is a weird, disorienting, like new style. Techie beep boop things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hear the techie beep boops. Don't worry. Yeah. Well, that happens. And then there's this big guitar wash and the verse is all disorienting. And then we get those half steps and the chorus just makes it gel perfectly. The beep boops, the tense feelings, the discomfort from the verse just all comes together in the chorus in a really satisfying way. Sure. You don't know me. You shut me out. I refuse to be unwanted. I'm going to make myself heard and known in spite of you. For context about the song, it's inspired by her interactions with the parents of a boyfriend who seemed to have judged and frankly misjudged her before they properly knew her. And the song is a reflection of how she feels about that. Unwanted is a kind of song that, like, I think projects power through a lens of confusion. Like, why is this happening? I don't know, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it, and I'm going to call you out for it. I do think, though, the bridge is a lyrical ball drop. I tried to belong. It didn't seem wrong, which is a weird kind of double negative thing happening. My head aches. It's been so long. I'll write this song if that's what it takes. That's not for me. That's a certified buffoon moment. But the rest of the song, I think, again, very good on the emotional standpoint. Even if musically and lyrically it's a little bit confusing. I think it's meant to leave you feeling that way. And that's what's important. How'd you feel about tomorrow? Eh, can we talk about it tomorrow? No. <laughs> Regrettably, we have to talk about tomorrow today. Oh, well, in that case, it's okay. It's okay? I wanted to talk about tomorrow yesterday. Yeah, it might have grown on me overnight, but... You wanted to give it another day, another night to, to simmer? Yeah. But tomorrow's okay. It was a bit ordinary. Okay. We have to say a little bit more about tomorrow. I appreciate what you're setting up. No, no. I'm just laying down the groundwork for later. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, tomorrow was a little bit ordinary. Yeah. A friend is trying to comfort her and say, hey, you know, cheer up. Things will be okay soon. Like the normal kind of platitudes friends sometimes offer when things are hard. And she says that she tries to believe them, but ultimately she's like, look, not today. I don't know how I'm going to feel tomorrow. Like, no, things might not be better and could, in fact, be even worse. Oh. So she's kind of refusing their encouragement, but, like, not in a necessarily mean-spirited way. Just like more as a realist, I think, who can't see past the storms of her own situation at the moment. Like Mobile, it kind of starts off as a more acoustic song, but I think it ends up being a little more consistent and maybe captures a little bit better of a mood than Mobile does. That said, though, Tomorrow is absolutely on the rougher side for melody and hooks. Tell Me That It'll Be Okay is probably the strongest melodic run in the whole song, but Tomorrow just has no staying power. Did you find the same with Tomorrow? Or was it maybe better than I'm giving it credit for in terms of, like, memorability? Uh, no, it was pretty forgettable. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I don't know. It's wistful. Lyrically, it's very vulnerable. But musically, it's flimsy. And I think mostly forgettable. It was just too ordinary. Too ordinary. It's true. But you know what song was anything but ordinary? Complicated. <laughs> but we already talked about that one. So I said we'll talk about anything but ordinary. Yeah, that's a good pick to go to next. Track 8 is anything but ordinary. This one's fun. I have a lot of fun with anything but ordinary. It's a real personality piece. I, I like this one too. I think it's fun. She wants to be herself and do whatever she wants to do, even if it's not what people would consider ordinary. It's another one that certain parts of the song kind of were a bit forgettable, but that chorus. Yes, it's always the chorus. Definitely her strong point is making a good chorus. And, of course, like, just setting an emotion. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like her ability to communicate an emotion so clearly is built on the backs of both what the lyrics are up to, even if they're not necessarily as great standalone, and what the music is up to, even if sometimes it gets a little lost. I think it all contributes to the greater good of the song, which is really cool. I think... 
the chorus on Anything But Ordinary is probably the best one since I'm with you. I would accept an argument from Mobile, but that's it. I agree. I think one of the things about Anything But Ordinary that's so cool is her vocal range is so impressive. I feel like we didn't get a good sense of it always at any one point in this album up until right now. Anything But Ordinary, she spans a huge range on the vocals. To go to some of the lower points on the verses, right? Anything to make me feel, that's really low. But then somebody saved my life like that, that's a lot. <laughs> It's a huge jump in the in the scale. Yeah. It's so impressive. I do think the second verse doesn't necessarily land as well as the first. It doesn't. No, but I think that's the fault of the drums. They sound a little kind of mechanical at the end of the second verse. But honestly, that doesn't detract from the song too much. I still like Anything But Ordinary a lot. Do you have a good transition? I do, but it's something I'll never say. Oh, that was... Okay. Well, I guess we'll just have to chalk that up under Things You'll Never Say and move on to Things I'll Never Say, track number nine. Man, we're on such a strong stretch right now. I think this is a great back-to-back -back between Anything But Ordinary and Things I'll Never Say. What a good pair. It's very sing-songy, really, and honestly, I think that's what makes this song a little extra memorable. I don't think it was one of the album's, like, hit hits, but it's gotta be one you walk away with after the album stops, right? I think Things I'll Never Say is one that you remember for one reason or another, because there are several standout elements to this track, whether it's the da-da-da-da-da-da-da, or it's the idea behind it. If I could say what I want to say, I would tell you how I feel, but I can't, and I'm not going to. I really like the sentiment behind it. Yeah, it's got a really good melody to it, and I just can't get over the chorus hits. I mean, I know I keep, I sound like a broken <laughs> record at this point, but she just, she hits them great. I mean, the verses are a bit ba da ba 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 da ba 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 over and over, but I don't really care, because you got the melody to carry you through the verses, and then she hit, ramps it up every time with that chorus. I can say what I, yeah, I know. She's talking to this crush, not being able to articulate all of her feelings. It's an interesting blend of things that she's never going to say. You know, some of them are like, cute. I want to blow you away. I want to be with you every night. Like, sure. Normal. Very normal. Very good. And then she like pivots to, I want to see you go down on a knee. Marry me today. Like, that's a bit more intense. Like, we've really made a jump here. We've really made quite a leap. Yeah. I guess it depends on the context of this relationship. I don't think it's necessarily explicitly said that they're not already together. They could be long-term partners, for all we know. And maybe this is just her hoping he's going to finally propose. I just put it in the context of, like, a not-yet relationship that she's trying to make into a, a thing. But it doesn't have to be. I also really love, guess I'm wishing my life away with these things I'll never say. I love the concept of that. It's just, it's pretty clear that it's a sequence of events that's never realistically going to happen in this moment. But she still wishes it would. She's like wishing, I don't know, wishing her life away. What a great line. Yeah. Certified poetry. That's what's going on in her head. But what's going on in her world? Yeah, next she tells us a little bit more about what's going on in her world. My world is up next. This is a very personal one. It's all about her actual life at the time. You know, the small town Canadian lifestyle that she's grown up in and grown very accustomed to. I think My World is a really cool reflective piece for a first album. Because obviously now, you know, two decades on, we can see where she's gone and how far she's come and how different her life is now from the world that she talks about in this song. So it's really, really cool to me to have this perspective from a time when she wasn't just close to this experience, but like actually day-to-day -day living in it and then became a rock star out of it. It reminds me of Rivers Cuomo on Weezer's In the Garage, just describing life before you're famous. And I think because of that, I think my world gets a little clunky lyrically and cluttered with ideas and concepts and things that she wants to express about her life. But it's very specific, like very specific about her life, not anybody else's. Yeah. And it's also very personal. And the fact that it's track 10 on these on longer albums, by the time you get down into this, the latter part of the album, you just don't have room for it anymore for anything that's too clunky or... Oh. To me, it's just like, especially off of one listen, it's just like, at this point, I just, I don't have the capacity. I couldn't tell you much about this one. Just kind of slipped from me. You're checking out already. Uh, not completely, but for this song. No, I get that. I think I always just kind of trot my way through my world. It's like always a pleasant, good experience, but it just doesn't stick there like I think it should. I just kind of pass through it. Yeah. I don't engage with it on any kind of deeper level. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if it was bad, I definitely would remember it, right? And I'd be talking about how it was bad. That's true. I just don't have room in my, like, top tier stuff for anything that's not stand out a bull. Sure, yeah. And, and the chorus is, like, good, but it doesn't have a lot of movement, which I think is honestly why I lose it so much. This might be her weakest chorus on the album, or at least one of them. Probably. Which is sad, but, I mean, I get it. It feels like, you know... It, 
to cite a different example, you know, we didn't start the fire. That's an instance where Billy Joel wrote the lyrics first and then tried to make a melody that fit the lyrics. And the melody just is like one note. He's very dissatisfied with how the melody came out because he built it around the lyrics. And that feels like what happened here. The lyrics are good and exactly, I think, the way that she would want them to be. And she tried to stick a melody to them that just doesn't hit right as a chorus, like the rest of the choruses on the album. Spotify plays wise, it's second so far on the album. It's second to Unwanted. We've got two more tracks coming up that are lower than it, but it's down there. Yeah. In terms of like lasting popularity. First, we got to talk about Nobody's Fool. Nobody's Fool. Again, a familiar sentiment. As she's already talked about, I mean, repeatedly on this album in her career and in her life, she's just not going to change for anybody. She's going to do things her way and she refuses to be anybody's fool or their puppet. That's what Nobody's Fool is kind of all about. What did you think of this song? I go back and forth on my opinion about the La 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 Las. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It was like from li- line to line in the lyrics. I was like, I like these or I don't like these. Oh, very hot and cold. I don't really know why. Yeah. I, I would say it's been a minute since we defined anything for, you know, for the cookbook in terms of how to write a song <laughs> in the style of an artist. How to write an Avril Lavigne song? Uh-huh. Yeah. Use the word yeah. Oh. I mean, the amount of songs she has that uses the word yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a significant way. <laughs> You're right. That's a good ingredient for the Avril Lavigne song. Also, big guitar and an explosive chorus. Certainly good elements to include. Yep. I think musically and instrumentally, I like Nobody's Fool a lot. The production might be a little bit of a product of its time, but I think it's aged really well. You know, with the step-ups, that feels a little old, but like satisfying in its style. But I think the spoken, wrapped kind of sections of the verse, like, that's a bit of a choice. I think, to a certain degree, like, it's really good to explore the boundaries of what you're comfortable with and what audiences are going to respond to, especially early on on your first album, you know? Like, that could totally influence your direction for your next album. If everybody listens to this and goes, wow, that was really great, maybe you do more of it. So I get, like, wanting to push your boundaries. But I think the, the rhythmic talking is a little bit of a swing and a miss on Nobody's Fool. And also, like mix that talking style with such profound lyrics as understand that i can't not be what i am i'm not the milk and cheerios in your spoon i mean that really kind of just torpedoes parts of the song for me that didn't do it for you no i don't think her refuting cheerios necessarily like was the album's most thought-provoking moment (laughs) and i gotta be honest you know when i said the album was front-loaded i was not kidding and and mostly the biggest consequence of front-loading is just this backlight yeah and i think that's really the case from i mean my world all the way down to naked it's got it's got moments but it's just so much different i mean is it too much to ask that you save something for the back end is it i don't know yeah i just feel like it really tails off here really thins out it's almost like two different albums really Mm. if you make the cut at anything but ordinary or tomorrow you got like two separate halves all together that like oil and water to a certain degree don't mix yeah because on one level they're also like very thoroughly avril lavigne 2000s pop punk but on another level they don't blend (laughs) too much to ask is the next track in the unfortunate soft downward spiral of the album. And it's not, I don't mean to like totally undersell it. There's still some quality stuff here, but too much to ask, you know, when she was 14, she met a boy who promised to call and I guess he never did. Is it too much to ask for him to keep his promise and like actually call? It's got its moments, you know, but it also feels very much like a 14 year old scorn song. I really like the three, four time signature on too much to ask i think that feels really good almost waltzy and there's some absolutely beautiful chords buried in there just like a lot of depth in the chord progression that i really like and i like the chorus i mean lyrically every time i try and make you smile you're always feeling sorry for yourself you think that you're loveless is that too much that i'm asking for i think that's really strong i think i was most disappointed by this chorus on the album oh even more so than my world yeah because my world didn't make me think it was gonna be a good chorus oh this one teed you up and then undercut you yeah like the way she leads up into the chorus i'm like oh this is gonna be a big chorus and then i just i didn't care for it yeah i didn't like the way it flowed it was like the rhythms and the melody were at war with the pace she wanted to take it at i don't know it was 
It's all a bit all over the place in a way I did not like. No, I get that. And also to listen to it, I mean, it doesn't feel as necessarily as well produced as some of the others. Mm. I feel like her vocal sometimes gets lost in this song. It's okay. Too much to ask. I'm lukewarm on. Would you choose weed over this song? You're so lame. Wait, what? That's one of the <laughs> lyrics in the first verse. She thinks it's going to work out till you chose weed over me. You're so lame. Oh, gotcha. That's pretty lame. That is a pretty lame thing to do. And finally, the capstone on this album, I do think is a bit of an uplift. Honestly, I mean, from too much to ask. It ends on a positive note. Yeah, Naked is the last song. And uh, it's very obviously a metaphor for vulnerability. It's a very good parallel. Honestly, the whole album has been pretty raw and personal and very incisive. So I think Naked is like a pretty rational way to wrap it up. You know, she's really like emotionally put it all out there for the last 45 minutes. So this is like a reasonable way to end. It's about finally finding a person that you could be perfectly comfortable with, who knows all your flaws and mistakes and thoughts and accepts you for it and loves you through it, which is sweet. Better than that skater boy that she said see you later to. I think it's a good antithesis, actually, to all these songs about loneliness earlier. You know, losing grip, I'm with you, unwanted. Like, now, by the time we get to Naked, there's someone here who's, you know, going to work with you and walk with you through it. She's not alone in the situation. So, in that way, things kind of end on a positive note for an album that very much spends its time dwelling in darker storm clouds. The chorus is better than some of the other stuff on the latter half of the album, but it still just never hits that power that the front-loaded side of the album has. No. What's interesting is this is also like a ballad-type song. Yeah. I think this would normally, if it were a little different, kind of be one of your normal go-tos. Maybe. Don't pretend like you can ever predict my musical tastes. Look, I'm not saying much about your musical taste, but I'm a pretty good predictor. Look at what happened in the mixtape for this week. I predicted every one of his facts, sometimes twice. <laughs> so, you know, c count your lucky stars. That's not happened to you yet. You didn't predict lifetime supply of stealth. That's true. I didn't see that one coming. It snuck up on me. <laughs> well, you know what else has snuck up on us? Final spin? Another episode's final spin. Man. Let's get some scores going. Realistically, couple last thoughts from me on the album as a whole. She made this record and did a lot of the songwriting when she was like 17. So I feel like the lyrical expectations kind of have to be tempered a little bit. Even still, I feel like there's a lot of gold in here. It's just once again at the front half of the album. Is that like your way of saying that like, I'm going to just make up numbers, you know? Her lyrics are a 70. But her being a 70 versus like the Beatles being a 70 means two completely different things because how could you expect her? You know, a 70 is good for a 17 year old, but if a 70 for like the Beatles would be bad. That's decently accurate. I is that like what you're going for? I guess that's kind of my point. It's impressive either way. Even if there's a couple swings and misses, there's a lot of gold is what I'm saying. Yeah. She still hits the mark a lot of the time. I was just trying to make sure you weren't like, you know, weighting your score to the fact that she was only 17. No. She's still competing against the Beatles. It's just her failing to meet the Beatles isn't necessarily a slight. Right, right. And it's just by the time we get to the end of the album when we've just, I mean, we're fresh off of My World Nobody's Fool Too Much to Ask Naked. I mean, a lot of the wow moments from Losing Grip, Complicated, I'm With You, Mobile, Unwanted, like a lot of that kind of fades to the far part of your memory. So you just have to like think about it as a whole. You have to refocus and remember where we've been and where we went. For me, music is an 86. Big choruses are a lot of fun. And, you know, a lot of the verses maybe are a little less on the musical side here, but definitely choruses make up for all that slack. Lyrically, 86. It's so emotional. The epitome of pop punk is the genre. And uh, instruments and production, I'm given an 83. Sometimes a little dated, but mostly works very well. Overall vibe, given an 87. I think once you're along for the ride, you're along for the ride with very few moments of like, wait, what? You know what I mean? Nothing really pulls me out of the album. Yeah. So overall, this album gets an 86.9 from me, which lands it at number 198, putting it below Tina Turner and above, oddly enough, Randy Travis, as far as our past episodes go. So she broke the top 200. That is cool. Mm -hmm. Good for her. That's my take on this. 86.9. How about you?
I kind of didn't have any expectations going into this one. Those are sometimes the most fun weeks for me. And I came out of it with expectations. Oh, interesting. For future Avril Lavigne songs. Yeah. I mean, it sounds to me like you started having expectations by the time we got to tomorrow. Yeah. Like half the album didn't meet the expectations that, you, that were set. The expectations formed real early. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what happens when you give me a front load. Hey, it happens. My top three in album order mm -hmm. losing grip oh complicated nice i'm with you wait let me check mm -hmm. that's it you don't get a honorable mention mm -hmm. so you skip skater boy i'll never say what ah. my what my honorable mention is not allowed to the things you'll never say are your honorable mention my honorable mention is on the list of things i'll never say because i can't this week all right <laughs> i don't know why i let you get away with that sort of thing but it's fine but yeah it's my top three. Very front loaded. From the first four tracks, you've taken three. Yup. Not totally unexpected. As for my score, score it. This is a tough one for me. Is it? I just I really enjoy the front half. Mm -hmm. I get kind of like how you said you could make two different albums. I could give it two different scores depending on which half of the album I'm looking at. Ooh, do that and then average them. That's kind of what I want to do. I don't know. That's kind of a bad idea, though. I just, I'm curious to know both of your scores is really why I'm encouraging you to do that. I could see myself giving this somewhere around a really high eight, maybe even possibly low nine. Whoa. Whoa. Low nine? Maybe, depending on where we drew the line. Wow. Pick your best half of songs. Like, pick your best six or seven out of 13. What would that score? Yeah, okay. If I could pick my best six out of 13 and I could jump around and didn't have to just split the album somewhere, uh -huh. then it would definitely get a low nine, I think. Wow. Probably go right above Tina Turner. <laughs> oh, wow. Almost where I put it. Uh, yeah. But I put it below. Then if I took the other seven or six tracks, you know, that didn't make that cut, it drops pretty significantly down to like maybe even a four. <laughs> ooh, ooh, four. <laughs> yeah wow you don't give many fours no so that would average out to like a six <laughs> <laughs> it would. yeah it would six and a half which is honestly probably about right six and a half so i'm gonna round that up though because i do like the song so much and give this one a seven out of ten also a seven that's two sevens in a row too you're you're streaky lately one more and you know jackpot jackpot well, you better not give next week a seven. Isn't it like seven, seven, seven? We'll talk about that next week, but... Isn't that a thing? <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Clearly, you are an experienced gambler. I don't gamble. <laughs> well, where in those sevens is it going to go? You put Otis Redding either above or below Young the Giant. Yeah, this one I think is going to go right above Bob Dylan. This goes right above Bob Dylan? Yep. You're hurting my soul. Well, that definitely looks like you tended towards the lower end. Well, it was a six and a half. Yeah. I feel like this album was dragged down for you by its weaker parts. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, 50% of the album I would have cut. It's true. So this is only slightly better than seven dinky Dylans. <laughs> yeah. Seven vapes in the air. More than seven dinky Dylans. Heck yeah. Hey. <laughs> If you got it, it's up. Seven vapes in the air. Something's in the air. That's it. Seven things in the air, that's for sure. Yeah, wow. But what are we doing for the playlist? Good question. Complicated has to be there. Does it? That would be my pick if you took anything else, but... Okay, well, I'm taking I'm with you. Ooh, ballad guy, sticking with his ballads. I'm okay with that. I think that's not what people would expect. I think Skater Boy is the other one people would be like, oh, the best two songs on... If we wanted to take something people wouldn't expect, I mean, you could take things I'll never say. Oh, no. Well, that's the thing I'll never take. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. I'd rather keep things simple and take complicated. All right, complicated, and I'm with you. I think those are pretty great playlist picks. I think those are pretty good picks, yeah. I'm excited to put them on the playlist and get rocking. But that brings us to the end, the tragic end of this, the 115th episode of Spin It, the record ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. Thanks for hanging out. If you'd like to hang out more, check out a different episode or listen to this one again. Just, you know, hit that repeat button. Dude, I don't think podcasts usually have a repeat button because that'd be a silly thing to do. But if you want to, <laughs> like, do it. If you're looking for more Spin It content, you can find us on social media at Spin It Pod on X. Can we just fully call it X now? I think that's sticking around at this point. Twitter X. 
You can find us on Threads or Instagram at Spin It Pod Official. Most other social platforms at Spin It Pod. But most importantly, we're on our website at www.spinitpod.com. Check out all the other stuff that's on there. Bonus content, blooper reels, extended B-side cuts of special episodes with more Spin It goodness. I think we could talk about it now because it's in the past. The Taylor Swift episode has been the longest edit of my life. <laughs> it's like two and a half normal episodes. It's so full and very fun it's a lot of taylor swift it is a lot of taylor swift anyway that's the past i'm really looking forward to next week i'm so excited and you just can't hide it i can't hide it that has no that's not a hint at all to what we're doing don't no it's not (laughs) don't get thinking we're going disco here i spent i swear i kid you not eight nine months listening to consecutive albums by this artist to try and prepare for a concert so i got very familiar with over a very short period of time. And now I'm real excited about an episode. So stay tuned to see what that's all about. And uh, tell a friend who... Tell a friend who... Would love a shirt that says Shrink Me <laughs> about the podcast. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Be sure to rate, like, subscribe, five stars. <laughs> Until next week, have a great week. Happy birthday, Avril Lavigne. And keep, keep spinning. spinning. It, isn't it weird that i can remember avril lavigne's birthday and i just miss all the others yeah you just miss literally every other important birthday on this podcast yeah i don't know why is something wrong with me (laughs) yeah and i don't mean to make you feel unwanted we've known that since before we did the podcast so dang wow okay (laughs) listen we're just a podcast they're just an audience could it be any more obvious (laughs) 